Hi, Fernando Mark. Nice to meet you. I'm the head of artificial intelligence of Accenture for the United Kingdom. And I uh, am the CEO of a company called Contact Engine. And we know each other now. We do. Because we just said hello to each other. <laughs> I think for us, ethics is, uh, is a great challenge. It has to be a, a sort of integral part of what we do. We're, we're communicating with our, our clients, customers in the, in the millions and millions of times a day. And uh, whilst what we do is relatively simple, there are uh, considerable ethical challenges. There are assumptions one could make about communication. There are assumptions one could make about the replies to people's replies to us. And we have to at all times be aware that um, uh, the, the right for us to have that communication is, uh, is not um, a privilege. Or it is a privilege, but it's not a right. And we have to make sure that we do that properly and ethically. So it's a very significant challenge for us. And it's changed a lot, right? Um... So I remember the, the dark days, maybe 20 years ago, doing, doing deep learning and doing interesting things and nobody caring about the question as much, right? Um, and for us, apart from the dimensions that, that you, you, you discussed just there, you also have the, how does it represent itself to employees, right? Yeah, absolutely. Not even, not even customers, employees. What do employees think about what we're trying to do? Where are we in society? Does it matter that uh, great technology from China has been kind of sourced somewhat unethically? Does it matter when we use it? So the, the and of course, the, you will know this from your, from your work, um, and it ties with what you said, our consumers are also starting to be very sensitive about it. So all these things have suddenly got very interesting very quickly. And I say interesting from a you know, techie, geeky perspective, but from a, from, an, from a society perspective, it's become just, complex, complex, complex. It has, and it, and it moves very swiftly. And uh, uh, governments can do many things, but acting at speed is something they don't often do. So mm. uh, uh, if you're putting the responsibility for making the right ethical decisions on companies or mm. states, um, uh, and the legislation is taking a while to catch up, you have to make um, uh, you have to be aware of who you are, whose ethics you're using. Yeah. So uh, do, does one want to use the ethics of a China or America or my own country? Mm. We have to take ethics very, very seriously because in many ways, uh, legislation is not caught up. Quite, quite. And uh, what is your own country, Mark? Um, uh, I always consider myself British, but I'm not, Spanish. not English. <laughs> So I think we have a multinational frame of reference. Um, so we, I spent the last year or so doing some research for the City UK, which is the, 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 the body that all the banks belong to, right? On AI in, in that industry and lawyers and professional services firms. And one thing became really interesting as it relates to ethical uh, use of technology and AI specifically. Uh, firstly, that everybody tends to want to do good, which is obviously, which obviously thank, thank God for that. Um, the other is that quite a lot of the regulations set up enforces for you to be ethical. Yep. Mis-selling and banking and you know, giving options, optionality and all these kind of things. So one of the interesting things that came out is all these firms saying, no, 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 don't, don't add any more regulation as it relates to the ethical use of AI. Just we need probably better understanding of the regulation. This is all for one industry, of course. The regulation we're already under, because if people understood that, you're actually under quite a lot, in the UK, this is very UK specific, we are actually very protected. Um, they were more concerned about the society's perspective on what is ethical and isn't being, you know, turning back on them in a sort of dangerous way and then making a mistake and then being shot in the, in the court of public opinion. There was a lot of concern about that. So we want to do good. We think the law kind of puts us in a position where we can. And the, the last aspect of this, which I love your view on, Mark, was they were quite concerned about um, second and third order problems. Let's use an example. But uh, if, if, for example, by the time it comes to your system to make a decision to give an answer to a customer, that's actually a compound of three or four other decisions that other, other systems have done. And we can't talk about AIs have done. AIs are no more clever than a kettle. So compound decisions that other systems have made. Very concerned about that. How does that fit into your... It, it's, a, it's an interesting observation because um, uh, your, uh, what I do is relatively simple. I begin conversations, I invite replies, and then mm -hmm. using natural language understanding, using machine le learning, I'm able to carry on those conversations. But there are 
temptations of making assumptions. Yeah. Um, companies know vast amounts of information about us as, as consumers, and mm. as therefore you could you could layer in socioeconomic information, gendered information, uh, wealth information, if mm, you wish, and that itself could could inform the conversation you have or the priority within which that conversation is um, is dealt with. Yeah. Um, I think that's troubling. Um, I think um, we, when we ever step into that world or are asked to do that world, we have to ask ourselves some very, um, uh, some very um, hard questions about yeah. whether it's right to do that. Okay. You can always um, lay claim to if it's better for the customer, then, then that's great for them. But you also have to, as you say, the, the, the layers of information that can allow you to do some kind of propensity modelling um, are vast, but you have to ask yourself whether that's right. There are uh, services that one, that one buys, one has, that um, um, you expect someone to have made decisions that affect that service. So that might be car insurance, for instance. So mm. my son would pay significantly more than I would because he's more reckless. Or is he as an individual? Mm. No, but people of his age are. That's okay. Uh, Likewise with um, uh, credit, one would expect to have credit limits um, associated with the ability to pay. And uh, and again, there are algorithms that do that and, and they seem to be fair and everyone's comfortable with it. But let's take another example. Let's take an example of washing machines mm. and warranties. So if two people use their washing machine differently, should their warranty be more expensive or cheaper as a consequence. Now, society is not ever so comfortable with that, and I'm not sure I am either. Mm -hmm. So when we have conversations or thoughts like that, the maths, the algorithms, the AI, if you like, allows you to do that. But society needs to be comfortable that it's done. So uh, mm -hmm. we have to wait for the moment when that's right. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure when that will happen, but we certainly don't do it now. Here's a different, different albeit uh, parallel perspective. Um, we see a lot of people trying things out and just because you can doesn't mean you should. But we also do see that depending on the frame of the company. So I've lived this week through an example in government where, where again, without going into the detail, some experiment is done. Uh, but all the people that are working on these things innovation-wise all have a, a deep ethical view of the world around them. And they may make small mistakes, but they, in general terms, understand what good looks like. So by the time this lands last week in an ethical board, a proper board with ethics, you know, with professors and all this kind of stuff, actually ends up flying with, you know, going through with flying colors, the, albeit with lots of questions, much like you, Mark, you just put together, that are you know, elevate the, 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 the problem from. So for me, it's a matter of elevation, right? So at the bottom layer, what, what we might think, actually, it's a great idea to do a, an almost like a self-service of warranties, depending on your use, which sounds quite fair, um, might end up in a higher level ethics board that says, I tell you what, it sounds like a good idea, but... I don't think it's going to work because actually it, it really isn't fair in the way that we understand warranties and, and use. And actually, in some degree, in that example, which is a wonderful one, which I'll steal from you, manufacturers can get away with a lot of things, whereas actually they should be building these machines to a high tolerance where and whatever that is reaches. So I think the for me, there's a the right in innovation should flow if your ethics kind of set up and your people understand what you stand behind should flow upwards to the point where considerations can be made about things not in the black and white, or is it right or is it wrong, but hey, good idea, but let's not do it. Or, you know, kind of great idea, let's do it. And we can think of these societal problems so as a individual, company, employee, society, world. Because of what we do in, in Accenture, which tends to be very end-to-end, -end, you know, all the way from you know, technology to people and processes and all these things, so the entire life of, of, of products and things like that. Um, we've been observing over the last couple of years what are the successful patterns of people that use AI and get value from it versus a lot of the patterns of people that use a lot of AI that don't get value from it or never get started. Uh, so Ready, Set, Scale is, is our, our view, our collective view through research and through our own experience of the things that people are doing great that they should do more of and some of those recipes and roadmaps and ways of working that will get you to, to, uh, to where you need to be. I mean, these, you're gonna, I'll give you a couple of examples you're going to immediately recognize because you're, you're, you're working all the time to get people out of these things. But the, the everlasting experiments, the land of we've just been doing experiments and you know, in innovation, we've been in this innovation thing, but it never goes to a customer, never lands on a customer's desk. Yet we all believe we've succeeded. Well, I'll tell you what, your CEO is going to look back and say, what have you been up to?
because none of this is affecting my bottom line or, or raising customer satisfaction or making people's lives better. So that's a great example of that. Or I'll give you another statistic that is absolutely incredible, which is that a very large percentage without, we don't get to get numerical on this, but let's say a large majority of work on AI never makes it to production. Fun, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. You know, in a world where you work on nothing but production, it's interesting that a large percentage of this never makes it. So how do we unlock that? What is the behavior that says, rather than investing immense amount in the, in the, in the, in the thing called AI, but getting little real quantifiable value, how do we change that? Yeah, it's an interesting challenge. And we have, uh, I think the uh, staff differential between our two businesses is about 449,900 people. Yes. employ about 100 people. Um, we have a, an innovation function which is made up of uh, um, sub 10 people, so it's very small. Mm -hmm. I, I have a view that innovation comes from small teams, mm -hmm. uh, but I would say that, wouldn't I? Yeah. Uh, but we have to tread a very careful path between the, the, I used to call it BYC technology. Why do you do it? Because you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we can't do much of that. It, it, yeah. it, we, we just don't have the, the, the bandwidth or the finances to allow us to do that. So we have to tread a very a very careful path between sort of pure research where I say to my colleagues go that way but it is that way not that way it's it's a general direction mm. not a specific outcome because research isn't like that research has to be elements of discovery yeah. but the moment it steps into something that's practically useful we apply it and when it steps into that that's really interesting I'll give you a nice example we know that there is a two-hour variance in the speed by which people respond to messages between midwinter and midsummer I've never acted upon that piece of information. Mm. There's, a, there's an implication to that which may affect the frequency of communication across day lengths, but we never acted upon it. We discovered it, we set it to one no. side, we remembered it, and we moved on. So we try to, uh, I suppose, fail fast is one of the mantras that people often say in the world of technology. It's not necessarily failing fast, it's recognizing that's interesting, but there's a direction of travel here. So we'll leave that to one side and then carry on moving down this, this path and then constantly test and apply what we've discovered to see if it works yeah. and do that in conjunction with companies like Accenture or, or, or other end clients as well. Yeah. Interesting versus useful, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is an inter so, but that's part of the thrust of this. So, and that's a, great, that's a great example of a recipe of how to work. But there's so many things going into this IR bucket. There's so much, uh, so many people that want to jump into it. Yeah. So much. Uh, I mean, I, I also run the data science function of Accenture in the UK, um, and so much, so many people that want to jump in the data science bucket, that it comes to the point where you think, hold on, there can't be that many people that are good at this. In the same way that we don't have endless architects because it takes years of, of, of experience, neither suddenly we've materialized endless amounts of data scientists. So you get this very, uh, in ready set scale, we see this set of, com you'll recognize this, set of compound things that tend to happen. Not every data scientist that comes out of a university in the UK wants to go and work for a bank. They may want to go and work for a technology firm, for example. So yet we have quite a lot of people that do data science in banks. So, okay, hold on. So are these people productive? Are they actually, or are they productive or are they learning? Mm. So you've got all these, you, you've seen the learning yeah. thing, right? Where you have large swathes of people learning on the job. And of course, the moment they've learned is when they go back to the uh, technology company. Yeah. So you've got this rotating wheel of people learning and not producing. You also, you get the pockets of excellence where people produce beautiful things. But this objective, this view of, you've put it very well, Mark, which is, hey, I found something that's actually useful. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it, and it's going to have the impact I want, um, and I'm going to just get it done, versus uh, I've produced a, a litany of interesting things, out of which none of them are actually making any difference to, to society as a whole. But they're all really interesting. And I think we've turned the corner for CEOs, you as a CEO will know, were from that, hey, this was, this was in the, I'm happy to receive interesting stuff that has potential, to my money now needs to be have a return. Yeah.